As the media landscape constantly reinvents itself, it'll be extremely important for all the media companies to keep on evolving. So what does 2020 hold for our media companies and media agencies? And who better to throw some light to this than our next speaker? Well, he's none other than Mr. Stephen Allen, Mediacom's worldwide chairman and CEO. According to independent research company, RECMA, during Stephen's tenure, as worldwide CEO and chairman of Mediacom, the company jumped from being the world's seventh largest media network to becoming the world's third largest media network. So without further ado, may I request Mr. Stephen Allen to kindly step onto the stage. And I would also like to request Dr. Anurag Batra to come up and steer a conversation with Mr. Stephen Allen. A huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for both the amazing dignitaries stepping onto the stage. Thank you. Uh, oh, hello. Good evening. Uh, please give Stephen a bigger round of applause. Uh, he had two conditions before he came up to stage, on stage. He said either I can have six shots of single malt come up or uh, applause would do. We haven't opened the bar, so can you give him a bigger round of applause? Thank you. Am I switched on? Uh, I was just going to say thank you for the very uh, generous introduction. I, I have to tell you that my mother would trade all of that just to have the word doctor in front of my name like uh, you. That's okay. I'm a fake doctor. <laughs> the university is owned by my sister. One day she wrote me a mail saying she wants to give me a PhD. And actually, I, you know, I'm the kind of guy who waits for emails. The moment an email comes, I send it back, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know the types yeah. and that. Sounds In like fact, familiar. people ask me, what did I get the PhD for? I said emailing. And <laughs> ironically, the mail went into a junk box for, I didn't see it for 10, 12 days. Uh, because it came from my sister. So I can get you that, doctor. It's easy. <laughs> I, I have permanent head damage. Thank you. So they gave me a PhD. <laughs> so if you want that, uh, we can get Dr. Srini to... Make it happen if you want, uh, Done. or Dr. Balsara, right. whoever you want, uh, okay. and then we'll come to you. But uh, on a serious note, um, also give Charles a bigger round of applause. I think you were very frugal with the applause you gave to Charles. Do you want to, do you want to answer your phone? No, no, no I have some questions. Call. You know, I'm not going to take phones. Okay, all right. I, yeah, but somebody's calling, I can't stop. I have questions here, so that's the only reason I have it open. Um, you know, since the time, this is the 19th year of the conclave. Since the time we started the conclave, this debate about specialization versus a full service agency has been on. I think almost every conclave, we've done this debate in some form. Mm -hmm. We're in 2019. Tell us in 2020, will we still have this debate? Specialization versus full service? Okay. Or the journalists, you know, where is the trend moving to. Okay. So uh, m maybe if I, if I may, Anirag, I will just a little bit about my background and in that context uh, about specialization. So uh, this is my uh, 37th year uh, with Mediacom. I like to tell people that I started when I was about nine. Uh, we meant to laugh. <laughs> uh, but uh, but anyway, the point is that when, when I started, uh, we were part of uh, one of the very early original, what was then called media independence. And in that time, uh, media specialism uh, represented about 5% of total advertising spend. So 95% was going through ad agencies. And really, you know, we spent, I spent the first few years of my career trying to persuade people why specialism was the way to go. Then along came an agency called Zenith, uh, which was really uh, Saatchi's unbundling media. And it kind of uh, changed everything because it then became the norm. Uh, and we all know, you know, as the years evolved, really virtually 100% of media was going through media specialists of one kind or another. The reason I tell that story is because I'm sometimes asked, Steve, you've, you've been around a long time. How, how come they haven't got rid of you yet? Well, I have uh, constant sleepless nights. And the reason I have constant sleepless nights, ask any of my colleagues, I, I really don't sleep very long. 
is because I'm always thinking and worrying about what do we need to do next? How do we remain relevant? And basically what's happened and what I've witnessed is if I go back over the last just even 20 years, uh, I mean, before that it was simple. We had TV, newspapers, radio, a little bit of out of home. Then along came this thing called the internet. That gave birth to a whole new generation of specialists, uh, search specialists, etc. Uh, then as it evolved, uh, we saw specialists in social, specialists in mobile. And every time it was like a kick up our backside, a wake-up call that reminded us that we needed to be better to specialize in these areas. And what you saw uh, often was these companies, these specialists selling or merging into the holding companies that sure. we see today. And I think today uh, holding companies represent uh, about 42% globally of all advertising investment. So the way I would describe it is integrated specialism. Uh, that's quite an oxymoron -ish. term, integrated specialist. It's like a sensible Donald Trump. Second, sorry? It sounds like a sensible Donald Trump. Well, <laughs> uh, or a sane Boris Johnson. Well, it, I, it, it, there's a contradiction. I mean, well, let, let, I think what we have to do is think about the customer. So our customer is clients, advertisers. And what our clients want more than anything else is simplicity. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where I say to a client, what's on your mind? What do you need? What do you want? And always somewhere near, if not top of their list, is I need more simplification. Things are too sure. complicated. Uh, so I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing I would say about the customer is all clients are different. Some clients operate in one market, some clients operate in one category, one product, sure. and then we have others that are multifaceted and global. So I think really my, what I'm trying to say is there is no one size solution that, that fits, fits all. Fair enough. Uh, because our business is client centric, it's their need centric, it's their business centric. Since you talk about clients, you know, clients have started to look at big four. Uh, so they've gone beyond media agencies for marketing investments for the first time. If not investments, they've gone for advice, consulting. They've gone for strategy. And media agencies or media investment companies on behalf of clients are not only competing with other media agencies, but they're competing with consulting companies. In that context, how are the needs of clients or the expectations of clients changing? And why is a media agency better equipped to serve those needs better than, a, let's say, a big four, you know? Okay, okay. I mean, I, I would add a list to that competitor. So it's not just consultants we're competing against. We're actually competing against clients. Sure. When we think about in-housing, which I'm sure, sure will come on. Uh, and actually talk about. But if I think about what, what are the clients asking for, to answer your question, uh, what, what the clients are asking for is, first of all, growth. So how do we grow our business? Secondly, uh, how can we use our data, particularly our customer data, our first party data, in the most intelligent way to deliver business outcomes for us, sure. to help us grow our business? Uh, and really, therefore, uh, we are very focused on how we actually do that and how we bring together the various parts of a client's business and their marketing services organizations in an integrated way to deliver them the best business outcomes. Uh, I think if you look at uh, agencies versus consultancies, uh, I think consultancies are at an earlier stage in their journey. Uh, I will always argue, if I take Mediacom, I mean, we have 120 uh, offices in 85 countries, uh, 9,000 people who are really totally engaged in finding the best and the right communications for our clients. And, you know, consultancy is one thing, and I'd, I will come back and talk about that, but implementation and execution sure. are vital. And specialist knowledge. And specialist knowledge. Sure. 
now since you talked about again client and in your opening comments you talked about clients expectations from a hold co right and charles is there in cans in a glo global conversation uh, the brand custodian of volvo said and he said specifically when it comes to wpp we'd rather work with a you know somebody at the hold co structure who understands our brands our objectives our perspectives and kind of have one person uh, dealing with us and then funneling it down to so while we i'm going back to that debate of yeah specialization versus holding company consolidation so give us a real example of how you done it for one or two clients okay so i mean recently uh we uh we actually won there was a couple of pitches actually i can think uh, recently we won the centrica business globally that's an energy company uh we also won the global uh business for ebay uh in the case of centrica we actually formed a team that was called team nucleus uh which was made up not just of mediacom uh but the and partnership doing creative work and wonderman thompson doing crm uh i think uh and and fairly similar structure actually also on on ebay but i think how we're also bringing it together and nowhere is there a better example than here in mumbai uh is through the wpp campuses so we just opened and we're currently in the stages of moving for those that don't know to bay 99 uh and basically that will bring together 4000 people in mumbai we will also be having a campus too in in delhi opening uh at a later point soon uh and the plan across wpp uh by 2023 uh we will have something like 85000 people situated uh, or co-located i should say in 50 campuses and i think that brings unrivaled knowledge and the ability for people to work in a very close and tight knit fashion as a team you know um since we are talking of how the expectations of our clients are changing their needs are changing because you just said that we look at very specific approaches for specific clients and mm -hmm. their needs when you talk to a big four uh you know ceo he or she talks of digital transformation they don't talk of digital media investments mm -hmm. now digital transformation is a buzzword that is used very loosely yeah you know uh, where million millennials are engaging with all services and products uh, digitally mm -hmm. and only digitally in some cases uh, tell us what has mediacom done to be a partner for digital transformation and generally do you think media agencies are suited to be digital transformation partners with service the other service providers sure answer is yes uh why because we're doing it because we're delivering uh incredible results for our clients uh i don't think as i said before that we are it is interesting i must tell you because of uh, charles before something that uh reminded me so last week uh we had a uh internal meeting and jim hackett uh who Charles may know is the current uh, chairman and president of Ford he said something quite interesting and he said that uh he said often my competitors are calling me a dinosaur he said that doesn't annoy me he said what annoys me he said is that they think that that they think that I'm not doing something about it that I haven't recognized the change uh and that we are making our own progress and i thought and I, and there's another point just to come on to the uh uh customer centricity because uh he he gave an interesting example actually about uh, i don't know how many of you know peloton if you hands up if you know peloton okay so peloton uh is an exercise bike it's an exercise bike that connects people from all around the world into classes it's brilliant that company is about to fetch a valuation of 8 billion dollars think about that 8 billion dollars for an exercise bike and what was interesting about that was it wasn't about how do we make a better bike it was about how do we make a better customer experience sure uh so the point there it's not about technology for technology's sake 
It's about actually what you do with technology and data. I could give you a couple of examples of that if you want. Sure. You know, uh, Srini was speaking at our business world with another, you know, business product that we have. And his presentation was not so much about media. It was a lot about the business environment. And then he came to the brand and business. And one of the things he, he talked about almost everything you're talking of. One of the challenges for media agencies is the remuneration structure from clients. It has been under pressure over the last five to seven years. Yeah. And one of the reasons we're talking about digital transformation and media plus and consulting and non-traditional areas of remuneration is because the traditional media planning buying business is under pressure on fees. Mm -hmm. And I'm being polite about that. Mm -hmm. It's been under pressure. So tell us in India, it has become a sub 5%. Again, I'm being liberal number in most cases. Uh, do you see revenues from non-traditional services, which is beyond media planning, in the next three years outstripping the revenues that you have from media planning? So media planning gets you an entry, but then you do a lot more which is beyond media planning, Mike. Uh, no. Uh, I think what we're seeing is a, is a shift, uh, and it's been a shift that has been going on now for many years, but our core business of planning and buying media, if you like, uh, is still there. And it may surprise you, I don't know, but at, certainly at Mediacom, and that includes Mediacom in India, is growing. Uh, that, that could be, you know, for a variety of reasons, including sure. maybe winning market share. Uh, but the, the add-on areas, so particularly if I think about consultative areas of our business, content areas of our business, analytics and data areas of our business are definitely growing. There's no question. And, you know, just on the in-housing piece for a moment, I, I, I saw an interesting piece of independent research last week. Uh, so, because I know there's a lot of talk about in-housing, and that's obviously true in India as well. Uh, and the statistic that I saw was that 27% uh, of advertisers, this is globally, 27% of advertisers are considering, thinking, or intending to bring programmatic buying in-house. The number who are thinking about bringing media planning and buying in-house is 17%. Uh, so I, I, I think there's a threat there, but I don't think we're talking about the destruction of our business. Sure, I, I, not, I didn't uh, suggest that. I just said that the margins are under pressure. Mm -hmm. And hence, you need to find alternate sources of bridging the gap. Yeah. And I, and, and I think, you know, what we have been increasingly doing, certainly at Mediacom, is moving what I would call people might term more upstream. Uh, and I think a great example of that is our partnership with Mars. So Mars is a client that we globally won uh, about one and a half years ago. And I would say it's, it's a partnership in the truest sense of the word. So, you know, aside from doing uh, the basics, uh, we are really at their side with them, looking all around the world at new technologies, which has uh, been well publicized under what they call Operation Launchpad, uh, being their eyes and their ears, and thinking with them uh, not just about media transformation, Ma market entry. but business transformation. And market entry. Absolutely. Pos possibly. Uh, one of the things, again, I was ch chatting with a WPP leader, uh, and he said, I asked him, what are the three top areas from where non-traditional revenues will come? And he said, sports, e-commerce, and digital transformation in general. I mean, digital transformation applies to it. But he talked, sports is a big area where more and more uh, clients are investing money. Mm -hmm. um, second is e-commerce. And third, he talked about the fact that there are consulting uh, mandates for digital transformation and they may lead to downstream work of actually doing it which we may set up in-house or subcontract. So these are the three areas in India. What are the areas globally that you see where media agencies are well suited to be the advisors of future? Uh, I, I would say 
definitely around data and data analytics, uh, or even business science, some people would call that. Uh, definitely around content. So that's content creation and distribution. Uh, and now increasingly, you know, we're talking about real time or dynamic creative, which is really about having not hundreds, but even thousands of messages going out at the same time to different components of a, t of a client's or advertiser's target audience and, and refreshing and changing that as, actually as it's actually happening. Uh, I would say uh, also uh, content uh, in the broader sense of the word in terms of entertainment uh, is an area that has actually been of huge growth for us inside WPP. Sure. Sport is interesting. You mentioned sport before. Uh, I, I would say largely the holding companies as a whole uh, have probably been less dominant, less influential than the IMGs of this world and other well-known sports companies uh, that you would name. And, and actually, when I think about, I mean, India is a great example, but uh, all around the world, many advertisers will invest as much, maybe even sometimes more, in sport than they do for paid for uh, media, uh, but I think you know one of the one of the important things, if my well, one of the important things for us as we move forwards uh, and about we think about our future is we we have to be more automated, so more efficient, uh, and actually I think our focus is increasingly being on what I would call quality media. Okay, particularly in a digital world where environments can be less safe uh, and there are obviously always questions around viewability. Uh, ad so, fraud, digital ad fraud. A, a, absolutely. So, uh, so, so we're thinking about that and I think the important thing there uh, is about buying for our clients' audiences rather than eyeballs. And what that means is actually uh, spending money on people that actually are the relevant people that may have some intent to purchase or should have some intent to purchase. So I would say to agencies, agencies, the agencies that will be under threat are the agencies that are not talking about what we would call source of growth uh, or not, uh, as I said before, uh, talking on that other matter. Now, just to give you an example of that, uh, I was uh, really quite proud last week that we, uh, we won an award at the m and Global Awards for some work that was done here in India uh, called, uh, we called the campaign Cradle of Health and it was for PNG Pampers. And the, the insight here was, and I didn't know this, but in India the, the penetration of diapers used uh, for newborn babies is 10%. So in the UK, it would be nearer 100%. Uh, so 10%. And so when we thought about what well, source of growth, in this particular instance, it was almost the opposite. What was the obstacle to growth? And the obstacle to growth, which makes me laugh, is, was the mother-in-law. Uh, and Always the it. Hmm? Always it. Yeah. Well, the, <laughs> the, the, the mother-in-law... Uh, telling the daughter-in-law what she did for her son and how actually diapers run healthy and not the way to go. So that was a brilliant insight uh, and we tackled that through actually talking in a really direct and clever way to the mothers, explaining the health benefits, uh, going out, uh, doing workshops, getting government involved, the result of which that penetration of diapers went up by 5% which was very impressive. Fantastic. So it's market creation in some sense. It's not just advertising, it's market creation for clients. Uh, you know, because of your global role and having seen the three, four major growing markets uh, that are growing in the world, what do you think is unique about India? And why India will do well and better than every other market. Do you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased you asked me that. So, uh, one of the reasons I was here this week, other than I'm very honored to be here with you, uh, was that uh, we, 
were meant to be having a global board meeting this week in Mumbai. Unfortunately, we had to move it, but I still came. Uh, but, uh, and the reason we wanted to do a global board meeting here was as much uh, for me to give a kind of kick to my global team to talk about and to think about India. Uh, because I think it's a, a, a remarkable market with enormous potential. When we, you talked before about growth or slowdown of growth, uh, we have to look for our own source of growth. Sure. I talked about that before for our clients. And the incredible thing about India, that, I mean, there are several things that strike me. First of all, your GDP growth, even if it's slowed down a little bit in recent months, is still makes you the fastest growing major market in the world. Sure. You've had a GDP growth 7 8% the last few years, first thing. Second thing, if I look at your, the advertising investment as a percentage of GDP, in this market, it's 0.33%. In a market like China, it's 0.7%. It can double. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and many other markets. And the global mar average is 1.25%. Exactly. So I think, you know, as agricultural areas and other people come into your consumer economy increasingly, and we'll come on to e-com because that's going to help too. So uh, then I think about digital penetration, okay? So in the UK, 60 pennies in every pound, 60% of advertising investment goes online. In the US, it's 53%. In India, it's 22.5%. It's 25 now. Okay. 22 and I won't argue the two. Yeah. But 25. But, so you are still in the middle of a digital revolution. Sure. Uh, I think also when I think about e-commerce. So right now, today, uh, e-commerce here in China is about 3% of purchases. Uh, that's going to go up rapidly, and it was interesting to see Amazon setting up an enormous center in Hyderabad, uh, which is a sign of intent. Uh, I know you've got Flipkart here, uh, interesting the deal that they did with Walmart, uh, I, but I would say to you, uh, uh, don't underestimate Amazon. But the, the, uh, the level of growth opportunity, when I add all of that up together, is really fantastic and it's a place I think where agencies like ours can prosper and, and still enjoy significant growth. You know, uh, I would agree with you that I think in my personal view as a somebody who watches the space, I think uh, Amazon was very smart. I think Walmart overpaid f for Flipkart and I, I said this publicly, we said it in our publication, but I think it's about they let Walmart pay more you know, mm -hmm. uh, what Walmart makes of it in the future, who knows? Maybe they'll make it work. They have to make it work. Yeah. They put $15 billion. Yeah. That's a lot of money. So it also showcases the importance of India. Mm. But unlike the Chinese investors, the Chinese investors are the smartest investors. They always invest at the end of the valuation cycle. Whereas the American investors have invested at the top of the valuation cycle. Yeah. In fact, in most cases, the American funds have created the valuations because mm -hmm. they themselves invested, whether it's Tiger and we can go down. They well, always, the Chinese wait for the market to slow down. Chinese are investing as we speak more than anybody. And I know it because of my other ad. Yeah. Right? So I think uh, I agree with you that Amazon is the smarter one because they'll do what possibly Walmart did in $15 billion in two, three billion dollars and better. And then there are integration issues. Uh, culture issues and so on and so forth. So I think I agree with you that Amazon's bets in India are getting bigger. That shows that India is a very big market. Even Walmart's bet. I mean, these are good indications of where. And what, what was interesting, if I'm correct, I, I saw that Amazon uh, even uh, will invest in bricks and mortar uh, here uh, in India initially. Uh, and then evolve with the market. And, and, and I think you're right about valuations. I mean, the, the multiples, you know, our shareholders could only dream <laughs> and dribble about. Uh, but I think, you know, if you think about Amazon, I mean, it, had a, it has a market cap capitalization of almost $1 trillion. Yes. Uh, and really, up until only three years ago, it was barely making a profit. But it's about the future, and people sure. are buying future growth. Yeah. 
Now, coming to my last question, and we'll bring the audience. From the time we started Exchange for Media, this is the 19th conclave. We've been talking about, again, the at least last eight, ten years, the convergence of Silicon Valley, uh, which is really technology, with Hollywood, which is content, mm -hmm. and Madison Avenue, which is advertising. Our business, which is the business of media planning, buying, investing on behalf of clients, communication, has really, in some way, uh, no, being impacted by convergence. Madison Avenue, Silicon Valley, and uh, Hollywood coming together. Mm -hmm. um, how has that changed our business? You talked about content briefly. Well, I, I think uh, I mean we're seeing it manifest itself in many ways. I mean we're seeing a uh, time. Uh, we, we're seeing a convergence of platforms and content owners. We've seen some very big acquisitions and mergers. Uh, and if I just think for a moment about, I mean, OTT, really interesting here in India. So I, I, again, I, I saw a figure uh, that the growth in OTT, so that streaming, has been something like 30 something percent. I saw a figure uh, just yesterday in the US, so streaming in the US has grown in the last year by 33%. The important point being now that in the US, 14% of homes, up from 11% a year ago, 14% of homes are getting their television or their AV or their program content uh, through OTT. So that's another interesting point, particularly here in a very, what I would say, content-driven origination market that you have, obviously, in, in India. An example is... Sanjay Gupta from Star is there. They're trying to take Hotstar as a very successful example of what OTT can do. Of course, they have top-notch content, but they're taking the Hotstar to other markets because it's been such a big uh, success. So we agree. I would like to get the audience to ask one or two questions. And uh, my last question I already asked in terms of technical. I want to ask you, what is your one prediction for future for our business? Just one. If you are to say something that is really going to change our business, what would that be? Uh, I would say that uh, all media will become addressable, which will mean that all addressable media becomes programmatic. And that's good or bad? Uh, I think I'm, I, I don't I mean, want to. I don't, don't want to avoid from the, from the agency I think, standpoint. I, I think it's good and bad. So, uh, and I just let me say why. Okay, I think it's good because anything that automates and takes boring stuff away, allowing our people, my people, to be more creative, is a great thing. More innovation, more great campaigns like we've seen uh, today. Uh, I think it's only bad uh, in the sense that we know that machines can play tricks. So we have to invent new machines to kind of foil the, the other machines. Uh, but overall, I think a good thing. Yeah, anyway, by 2034, which is 15 years from now, uh, we predict singularity where machines will be as smart or as intelligent as humans or more. So that singularity moment could won't happen faster. Won't take them 15 years to catch yeah, I mean, up with as me. As of now, that's the prediction today. It possibly will happen faster. Yeah. So I'd like to wrap up. Uh, if there are any questions, we can take one or two questions. Uh, Mr. Balsara, any question? Mr. Srinivas, any question? Any comments? Mr. Gupta? So anybody else wants to ask? So I, Nadia is telling me to wrap up the thing. Uh, please give Mr. Allen a big round of applause. And right. Thank um, you very much. Thank you. It's been a... Honest conversation, at least you've been honest and you bring a, no, it's been a, pleasure a, a and huge, here. huge experience of across the globe and building something from scratch. You've been entrepreneurial in building Mediacom. I know it's part of WPP, but still to grow it at the pace it's growing takes entrepreneurial zeal. So we congratulate you from Exchange for Media and we look forward to more interaction. Thank you. Thank you for being Thank at you, the Anna Exchange Anna. for Media Conference. Thank you.